book of Kings, chapter 5. And if you like to continue the story, you'll need to come next Sunday morning because we're doing this Sunday mornings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little maid from the land of Israel and she waited on Naaman's wife and she said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him, him of his leprosy. So Naaman went and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the maiden from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten festal garments. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you rent your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry, and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa the rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, if the prophet had commanded you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know now that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant, but he said, As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, I pray you, let there be given to your servant two mules burden of earth. For henceforth your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. In this matter may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, Go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman the Syrian in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he alighted from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say there have come, just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Pray, give them a talent of silver and two festal garments. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two festal garments and laid them upon two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. 
And he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did I not go with you in spirit when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, men servants and maidservants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper, as white as snow. I think every preacher has a sermon on my text for tonight. It's the little phrase at the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 5, but he was a leper. Do you know, I noticed you didn't shudder when I read that. Neither did I. It didn't send a chill down my spine. It didn't make me say immediately, poor fellow. And there are two reasons why leprosy doesn't hit our hearts. One is that we know very little, if anything, about it personally. You may have seen pictures of lepers in missionary magazines, but you haven't had a loved one stricken with leprosy. There is a large building up in Newcastle on Tyne that I used to walk past regularly, and one day I said to my father, what's that building? And he said, that's the Mary Magdalene Home for Incurables. But before it was that, it was the last lepra, leprosy hospital in England, the very last. There is no leprosy in England now. If you go round the medieval churches of Britain, you'll invariably see in one wall a window. And that window will be barred, but open. And it will be the leper's window. And when they had a communion service, the bread and the wine would be passed out through a hole in the wall to somebody who couldn't come in and sit down because they had leprosy. Another reason why we don't fear it as we once did, why we don't shudder when we hear the word leprosy, is because it is now succumbing to medical aid. The sulfanamide drugs are now conquering this. They can now cure it in early stages or at least arrest it in later stages. And like things like tuberculosis and diphtheria, they no longer come with terror because we're on top of these diseases. I suppose if I'd read out Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he had cancer. That would make you feel it because that's still something that we're not really on top of. And I want you to realize the horror of these words. A man who'd got everything but a future, a man who'd got to the top of his career, who had status, success, everything behind him, but a death sentence within him. It's a horrible and loathsome disease because you don't die straight away. You die by inches. Your extremities rot away. Your fingers and toes drop off. Your ears and nose disappear until you are a grotesque caricature of a human being. Not only is the disease itself horrible, but you notice it doesn't say Naaman had leprosy. It says Naaman was a leper. That word leper is not used now that we've conquered the disease. The mission to lepers has changed its name to the leprosy mission. Because the very word leper meant someone who was shut out. Someone who was so infectious that you didn't dare go near them. Mothers were forbidden to kiss their own babies. And people were shut out of society with this dreadful thing. I remember reading the story of the Dutch priest later known as Father Damien how he went out to Honolulu as a missionary, but one day witnessed a man being put into a canoe with two days' food supply and pushed out into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And when he said, where is he going? They said, with luck he'll get to Molokai. Why? Because he's a leper and he mustn't stay here. That's where the lepers go. 
and they pushed him out into the ocean, hoping that he might paddle his way to Molokai. That Dutch priest took another canoe and he followed them. And he went to the little island of Molokai where he lived among the lepers in the leper island of Molokai, dreadful place. It was a death sentence to go. And they wouldn't listen to him about the love of God. They wouldn't believe in a God who cared for them when society had thrown them onto this island. Until one day, one dreadful day, he tripped as he was cooking his midday meal and fell and the cauldron with the boiling water for the soup spilled over his leg and he didn't feel it and he knew he was a leper. Then they began to listen. Then they began to believe that a God who would send a man to take their leprosy on him must be a God who loved. Now that's just to set the scene. It's just to give you the feel of this horrible situation. It's to try and help you to feel what Naaman felt when one day he noticed that a patch of flesh had gone pale. To try and help you to feel what his wife felt. To try and help you to see the situation. A man at the top of the ladder. A man who had given victory to his country, a national hero, right-hand man of the king. And suddenly he knows that he's going to die by inches and that he'll have to give up everything that he'll have to leave his wife, that he'll have to be shut up, maybe not sent out of the country. A man of his position would be locked in the bedroom and food would be pushed through the door to him. But he was a leper. Now this story is about a man who had leprosy and had it taken away by God and another man who was perfectly healthy and was given leprosy by God because God can do both. But before we look at those, Let's just set the scene. The place was Syria, a little country that is largely desert and barren mountain, but in the center of it, like a jewel in a barren setting, is the lo lovely little oasis of Damascus, which owes its existence to two rivers, the Abana and Farpa, which flow like crystal clear water, so clear you can see every weed on the bottom, through the sand watering the garden of Damascus and then they simply dry up in the desert and the rivers don't reach any sea. And there is this little jewel of an oasis, Damascus. It is on the main trade route through the desert from the Tigris and Euphrates to Canaan and Egypt. And therefore it made its money in two ways, trading and raiding. It had no other natural resources. So the trade went through Damascus and when they wanted more money, more labor, they simply went into a neighboring state and they raided it and they brought back slaves and anything they could steal. And it was Naaman, captain of the hosts of Syria, who had on one raid brought back for his wife a little girl and said, I've got a slave from you. We captured her. We've killed her parents and we've brought this little girl. Now you can have a maid. And here's your maid. That's the background to the story. And I must begin the story by looking at that little girl. I think this little girl is one of the loveliest characters in the whole Bible. I do not know her name. When I get to heaven, I want to find this girl. I'd love to meet her. Little girl, robbed from her home, taken right away from her family, probably having seen them die under the hands of these raiders, forced to go to a foreign country at an early age, and there she is, and yet she shines out for her faith, her hope, and her love. And she had every excuse for being bitter and resentful. Look at her faith. She never forgot the religion in which she'd been brought up taken right away from it, never able to hear a man of God speak, never able to worship with the people of God, she yet went on believing in the God of Israel. Now she could have said, well, where is God to let me be taken away like this? She could so easily have said, I can't believe in God anymore to let this happen to me, but no. She still went on believing in God. The faith of this little girl is marvelous. 
One of the books I've heard about recently is a book that won the Nobel Literature Prize last year. It's written by a man who was in the Siberian camps, sent there by the Moscow authorities. And it's a true book of his life in that Siberian prison camp. It's not written by a Christian, but in some of the pages there are Christians mentioned. Christian young people sent to Siberia because they were Christian. And this book, written by a man who may be an atheist or an agnostic, we just don't know, pays tremendous tribute to young teenage Christians who in Siberia kept the faith and ministered to the other prisoners. Now this little girl's faith stood this test. She still believed in the God of the prophet Elisha. Secondly, look at her hope. She said to this woman whom she was forcibly serving. She said to this woman, I wish your husband, my Lord, look at that, my Lord, I wish my Lord, my Lord, this Naaman, captain of the host of Syria, I wish my Lord could go to my country. Not I wish I could, but I wish he could. I wish he could, because I think he could be cured. In fact, her hope is stronger than that. He would be cured. Little girl, saying to this great man, you could be cured. And the third thing I want you to notice is her love. Do you notice there's no thought for herself, no trace of self-pity? Just sheer love for a man who's her enemy, a man who's done terrible things to her. And yet she says, I wish we could do something to make him better. And I believe that if he went there, he could be. The sheer love of this little girl. Well, now she was a nobody. But God uses nobodies to speak to somebodies. God can use a little girl to speak to the top man in the land. And her message got through. It got through to the king of Syria who said to his captain, you better go. Try anything. I would go. And here is the lowest in the land giving orders to the highest in the land. I'm thinking now of a man I used to know, I still do, who was a, a top scientist. He was working in the research laboratory of uh, a very well-known firm whose vans you'll see passing through most towns in this country. He had a good job, brilliant mind. And I remember I spent hours with him discussing science and scripture and all the philosophies. And we discussed many deep questions, but somehow his wife thought he'll never be a Christian. No sign that he's getting any nearer. One day I went to that couple and I said, look, we've got some Salvation Army songsters from South Wales coming. Could you put up one of them? And they said yes. And so a little girl who was a hairdresser went to stay in this home. And he couldn't argue with her because she couldn't argue with him. And like this little girl here, she just said what Jesus meant to her. And she told this scientist what he could be if he'd let Jesus in. And he did. God can use a little girl to talk to a clever big man and put him on the road that's going to lead him to life. There was once an agnostic lecturer who used to travel around England lecturing against the Christian faith until one day he met a little girl reading a Bible and he said, What are you reading that book for? And she said, Because I love it. And it pulled him up with a jerk. And Brother Home became a Christian. Well, I could spend all night on this dear little girl. Lovely character, but I, I must go on. Let's now look at the great soldier. He had everything a man could want in his home, in his career, everything. And I want you to notice two things that are said about him. One, the Lord had given him what he'd got. He didn't know the Lord. He didn't acknowledge the Lord. He didn't worship the Lord. But everything that he had that he valued had come from the Lord. The Lord gave him. And there are men today who call themselves self-made men. They've, they've gone up the tree. They've got a good business there. They've got a reputation. They've got everything. They forget the Lord gave them everything they have that they value and cherish. Naaman didn't acknowledge it any more than others acknowledge it. He didn't know that what he had, God had given him. 
The other thing, but he was a leper, meant that it was all going to be taken away. In these two respects, Naaman is every man. Everything I have in my life that I value and cherish at a human level is something God gave me. And everything I have at the human level is going to be taken away. We are all in Naaman's position. The timetable may be different. We may not have a disease that is going to carry us off in a limited time. But we know certainly that everything God has given to us in this life is going to be taken away again one day. It's our position, whether we acknowledge it or not. But we have to ask, what was Naaman's real need? Well, of course, his health. A lady interviewed on television recently was asked what was the most important thing in life and what she would rather ask for than anything else. And she said, straight away, my health. More important than anything else, she said, is it? The story would have been very different if Naaman had been given his health, and that's all. He would have gone back to being a soldier. You could have now read his story. Naaman was captain of the house of the king of Syria, a great man of valor and in high favor, and he wasn't a leper. That's all the story would have been. You see, sometimes health is not our deepest need, even though we may think it is. God wants to heal the whole man, not just your body. Let's look at the state of Naaman's mind. His body was corrupt, we know that, and would become more so. But the state of his mind was commercial. In his preparations for the journey, he showed how he'd got to the top of the tree. He worked on two principles, the right people, the right price. And those are the two principles on which a great deal of our world is run. If you know the right people and can get an introduction, get a letter to the right person, go to the man at the top, you'll get on. And secondly, if you've got enough to take in your hand for them, every man has his price, you can buy anything if you've got enough. And so he said, the right person, who is it? And he got a letter to the king of Israel. The right price, he took altogether 12,000 pounds in our money and some pretty expensive clothes. And he said, now this will get me my healing. Knowing the right people and pulling the strings, knowing the right price and opening the purse strings. Isn't this life? And he got a rude shock when he got there. The king misunderstood and he found that when you're after a blessing of God, you can't approach this in the same way as you approach anything else. You can't come with money in your pockets. You can't come with letters to the right people. You can't get God's blessings this way. It doesn't work. But it was the state of his soul that I'm most worried about. Here was a man who was proud. He had a conceited soul. And that's his real problem. Deep, deep down, God was more worried about his pride than his leprosy. And God was going to deal with this man. Now, he went to Elisha. He finally got through to the man of God, and we're skipping some of the details. And you know that the man of God simply sent a messenger out to the front door saying, Naaman, go and wash in the Jordan River. And Naaman was furious for two reasons. First of all, he got no special attention. That tells me he was a proud man. I thought, surely he will speak to me personally. Surely he will at least come and address me. The great captain. No, Elisha just sent a second-hand message through a domestic servant. And Naaman was cross. Special attention. No one gets special attention with God. God is no respecter of persons. He welcomes all with the same love. Special attention ministers to our pride. Secondly, he expected special treatment. There was the patch. I don't know where it was. Maybe on his arm or hand. That would be a common place for it first to be noticed. And he said, surely he'll come out and wave his hand over the place and there'll be a spectacular miracle and everybody will say, oh, as they watch. And that would have ministered to his pride. He could have gone back with a great story and everybody saying, do you know what happened? There it was and he held his arm out and the magic. But you see, God was going to humble this man and deal with his pride and his soul sickness. Now, of course, it was an insulting message. Have you ever seen the Jordan River? It's a filthy little stream. 
It meanders for 60 miles from the Galilee down to the Dead Sea. And the further down it goes, below sea level, the more hot it gets. The banks are just crumbling mud as it drops down into the water. The water you couldn't see your hands six inches below the surface. It's a horrible little river. And if you see the Abana and Farpa, beautiful sparkling streams with green gardens either side. Oh, this is a man who'd rather be saved in a cathedral than a little tin mission hut. The right surroundings are right for Naaman. You see the message. You get the message. The pride of this man says, that filthy little river down in that deep valley, the lowest point on the earth's surface it is, me go down there? I need the right setting for this. I want the right hospital, clean sheets and all that. You can see it, can't you? And the battle went on. Now at this point, a very wise servant spoke to this man and said, you're ready to do the big thing. Are you big enough to belittle yourself? You see, before you can get healed by God, God needs to have a little man to heal. Big men don't get healed by God. And the real question is, are you big enough to belittle yourself? Are you big enough to stoop? If you'd been asked to do a heroic thing, you'd have done it. Why aren't you prepared to do a humble thing? It was a challenge to Naaman. And the battle went. And finally, bless him, the Lord won. He went down to the river, took off his uniform, all his medals, took off everything that made him a grand, resplendent figure, slithered down the mud, got in the water naked with all his servants watching what was going to happen, ducked himself in the water, came up with his hair streaming down his face, went down again. Do you know, if this had not worked, he'd have been the laughing stock of Syria forevermore. He really would. The story would have gone right round. You should have seen him in the mud there, up and down like a yo-yo. You can, you can hear it all. But when God gets a man to the point where he doesn't care what other think, others think, where he's humble and obedient, God's going to act. Three things happened to this great soldier. His body came with the flesh of a little child. And after the seventh time he looked and he was healed. Can you imagine his feelings at that moment? As he looked again, felt it, smooth, soft flesh with color in it, like the flesh of a little child, no longer bleached and twisted. It was a miracle, no less. No explanation for this apart from God. Nothing in the Jordan River can do that for leprous flesh. It was a miracle. But look what happened to his mind. He went back to Elisha and he still had the cure of his mind to go through because his mind says, look, I'm so thrilled. Take this money, please. It's worth 12,000 pounds to me to have this flesh right. But Elisha said, no, 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 no. As the Lord lives, I didn't do it. God did it. He must have the money. That's what he's saying, really. But if Elisha had taken it, that man would have gone home with the idea that you can pay for God's blessings. It is right later in a godly life to give money to God, but not at the beginning. Not even in gratitude for your salvation, not at first. It's important that at that point, there should be no gifts given so that it's understood to be free. God's blessings are absolutely free. They cannot be charged for. And thirdly, what about his soul? Look now at this man's soul. He says, you know, I've been utterly wrong. I've been thinking about a pagan god a god called Rimen and I thought he was real and my religion's been all wrong. And I'm finished with that religion. And bless me then said, look, can I take a bit of soil back home and then I'll be able to kneel on it when I say my prayers and I can pray to the God of Israel. Now, of course, a theologian could come along and say straight away, bad theology. He's got his ideas all mixed up. We'll have to put him in a preparation class and straighten this lot out. But Elisha said, go in peace. You will find that a young Christian will think very funny thoughts sometimes about God. The important thing is that they get to God. They will learn later. The God of Israel made Syria too. You don't need 
a basket full of Syrian soil to say your prayers to the God of Israel, God of Israeli soil rather. But never mind, he'd learn that later. The fact is he wanted to pray to God alone now. And even if it wasn't a very orthodox way of doing it, it was real. Furthermore, he said, now I can see I'm going to have complications. I've got to help the king of Syria into the temple of Rimen. I've got to bow when he bows or else if I stayed upright, he can't bow. And I'm, I'm going to be doing this. And then he said, the Lord pardon me for the compromise I might find myself in. Once again, Elisha didn't drop on him like a ton of bricks and say, oh, you can't go into a pagan temple. He said, go in peace. And I'll tell you why. As soon as a man says pardon, somebody else can say peace to him. As soon as a man is of the frame of mind to say, the Lord pardon me, then the peace comes. Those two words go together. One of the reasons we don't have peace, as we should, it's because we don't have pardon, as we should. Well, now let's come to the sad final part of the story. I wish I could stop here, but we go right through the Bible in our Bible studies. And the Bible is such an honest book. It tells you the best about men and it tells you the worst. I wish this chapter finished halfway through verse 19, but it doesn't. We've got to go on. There's a greedy servant and as Naaman packed the silver and the gold and the clothes back into his hampers and set off, one man's heart went with the gold and the silver, Gehazi. What Judas Iscariot was to Jesus, Gehazi was to Elisha. A man who'd served a servant of God. A man who'd had great spiritual privileges for his soul. A man who'd spoken the word of God. A man who'd seen the miracles of God. A man who'd been brought up among the people of God. A man who lived in the land of God. A man who'd had every opportunity to be a man of God. And yet, something in his heart stopped him. And it was greed. So important is this thing called greed that God gave a whole commandment out of ten commandments to it. And Gehazi's heart went with the silver and gold. And he thought, how can I get a bit of that? Oh, what a chance missed. I could buy a vineyard with just one of those talents. I could set up in business on my own. Oh, why didn't my master just take a bit? We could have done so much good with it. Do you know, that's how the flesh talks. I have the feeling that if the rich young ruler came to us today, we wouldn't say, go and get rid of all your money. We'd say, here's a form for the corporate giving scheme. Would you like to sign a pledge? Ah, but... We must be careful and we must be wise and we mustn't be greedy. And Gehazi ran after Naaman and his mind schemed and deceived, deceived Naaman, tried to deceive Elisha. And this man said to Naaman, uh, my master's changed his mind. We don't want all the money, but just a little bit of it to help two people who've come. And he got two talents. That would be about a thousand pounds. Just enough to set him up in business with a vineyard of his own. He came back. And you see the progress. His soul, with all its privileges, was a greedy soul. So it became a deceitful mind, scheming to get money. And then it became a corrupt body. Because Elisha said, I went with you when you went. Can you imagine what Elisha felt like when he had to say to his own servant, you want what Naaman's got, do you? Then have it. And Gehazi looked at his flesh and it was bleached. And he went out a leper. The very thing that Naaman had come all the way to lose, Gehazi now went out carrying. What's the point of studying the Bible? Why study these people who lived thousands of years ago? The Bible calls itself a mirror in which you can look and see yourself. Did you see yourself anywhere in these three? Did you see yourself in the little girl? I hope you did, and yet I have the feeling that if you were like her, you wouldn't. A simple person, perhaps in a downtrodden place, pushed around by others at work or in the home, and yet prepared to testify to the love of God, even to those who've ground you down. 
you see yourself there? Praise God if you do. I don't think many of us will. What about Naaman? Do you see yourself there? No, let's go to Gehazi first. Do you see yourself in him? Britain has had an amazing Christian heritage. Three quarters of the people in this country are christened in a church. There are Bibles on sale in every Woolworths, every W.H. Smith's. We have compulsory religious knowledge in school for 10 years. We have a church and chapel within reach of every inhabitant of this country. We have had all these privileges like Gehazi. And yet the sad tale is that our country is now ridden with a get-rich-quick complex. Whether it's studying form or filling in the pools and hoping to get that 300,000 pounds, don't envy that woman, by the way. Don't envy that woman. Or as I got this week, a chain letter with the names of four ministers on it asking me if I wanted 8,000 pounds for no effort except to get 20 other people to send off a chain letter. As I sit at my breakfast table, I'm offered cars and houses and everything on the back of the cereal packet. Get rich quick. They wouldn't do all this. I wouldn't get all the free offers through my letterbox unless business realized that we're in a nation of people who want to get rich quick. And we don't mind if it brings this nation to ruin if we can get a 30% wage rise this year. And it's Gehazi all over again. That could be written over our nation and therefore over many of us who are individuals who were brought up with every opportunity to be men and women of God and yet greed has spoiled it. And we finished up with the very things that we condemn in pagans. The very superstitions and perversions that missionaries originally went to conquer in other lands. Do you see yourself there? Finally, does anyone see themselves in Naaman? You're not a leper. Thank God you're not. But there's a worse disease than leprosy. It's called in the blunt Bible language sin. And it's a disease that's a killer. It's a disease that can kill the soul. And it's a disease that can separate the soul from God as the disease of leprosy separates the body from men. And it's a disease that only God can cure. And the cure is a very humbling one. I'll tell you what it is. Repent and be baptized, washing away your sins and calling on the name of Jesus. That's the cure. Oh, it's undignified to be baptized. In a few weeks' time, we're going to be baptizing people in the baptistry under this carpet. It's undignified. It's humiliating. It's just like Naaman in the River Jordan. It's just like Jesus in the River Jordan centuries later. Jesus was baptized, dipped in the same river. So were thousands of others. Repent and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of Jesus. That's the way into cleansing. That's the way into salvation. Let the last word be with Jesus. The Jesus who kissed a leper. The Jesus who came to make men whole. He went to Nazareth, his own town. And they looked at him and they were rather proud at first of the local boy who'd made good when he got up to preach and then his word shattered them. He made claims for himself that no village carpenter can make. And they became offended at him. Their pride was hurt. Here was a young boy they'd known running around the streets. Here was a young man who'd mended their chairs. And here he is telling them what to do. And they were offended. Their pride was hurt. And you know what Jesus said? He could see the pride getting hurt. And he said this. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. Truly I say to you, there were many lepers in Israel. But only one was healed. Naaman. Many lepers in Israel, only one healed. The tragedy is that in the days of Naaman, there were hundreds of people living in the Holy Land itself who suffered from leprosy and they were not healed. And I will tell you why. First, they lacked faith. They didn't come and ask the man of God to pray for them. Second, 
They lacked humility. They were too proud. So they didn't come and humble themselves. It was a foreigner, a Syrian, who came and humbled himself in the dirty river Jordan, who was healed. Jesus is saying to us through that saying, you may be familiar with me. You may be familiar with Christian things. Have you ever humbled yourself? It's those who humble themselves who get healed and saved. You see, the real situation is this, men and women. In Christian England today, there are many, many sinners. Very few are getting saved. But if you go to Latin America, if you go to Rwanda, of which we were hearing this week, if you go to Indonesia, and if you go to the hippies of California, you'll find thousands who are coming and humbling themselves before the Lord. But we British are proud, proud of our traditions, proud of our church life. And Jesus says, did you ever repent and get baptized? And wash away your sins and call on my name to save you. There are many lepers in Israel in the days of Elisha, but only Naaman was healed. Let us pray. The choir has been singing to us earlier, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And having believed that, Jesus tells us to do our part and to be baptized and wash away our sins. Let us in a moment of silence ask him whether we have ever humbled ourselves this way whether we have ever obeyed this command, whether he is not calling us now to trust him, to wash away our greed and our pride and everything that prevents us from admitting our need. Lord Jesus, we're all respectable people here. We've got nice clothes on. We're part of Christian England. And yet we know you don't look at us like that. We know that you call us sinners and that you've told us to wash and be clean. Lord Jesus, our pride finds this difficult. We'd like to follow you without being humbled. And yet you say, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord Jesus, may every one of us be ready to come your way, to swallow our pride, to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen.